mothers, you guys are the real MVPs. I have no idea what it took for you to get here this morning. So to the sleepless ones, to the ones who get everybody ready before you get yourself ready, to those of you who probably missed breakfast because you got somebody else breakfast, good morning. We honor you. We love you. Welcome to church. So this morning, what we are going to do, it's a very exciting morning we have planned. Worship was amazing. That was amazing. So our vision at the Gulf Coast Christian Center is that you would encounter God. We just did. That you would find community and that you would fulfill your purpose, the purpose God has for you. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to find community. Happy Mother's Day. I am so excited about this lesson and I'm, I'm just honored that you all came today to celebrate uh, Mother's Day at the Gulf Coast Christian Center, and we welcome our guest as well. We're excited that you are here, and uh, we're gonna have some fun, okay? Uh, one thing is that I did not know that Mother's Day is the third largest card day in America. And it's also the second largest gift-giving day Aside from Christmas, I'm looking at my daughter and she's, she's looking down, so. It's the second biggest gift day. <laughs> Besides Christmas. Now, I do want to say this. There's something about when um, a worship team gets together and worships. It's amazing. It's something when women get together and they worship. And it's something when men get together on a platform and they worship. And I know today you can feel that strength. And I'm so proud of y'all. <laughs> I'm so thankful for all of you because um, you did a fantastic job. And I can't, I can't wait to see what else God has to do in the future. Now, I understand that Mother's Day can be difficult for many people. And we want you to know that all ladies and all mothers, we are a family. And for those whose children are away, let me tell you that there's a scripture that says he will bring your children from afar. And he did that for me with both of my girls. And so I say the same thing for you. And we've seen some restoration, haven't we? So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God is always faithful. There are single moms. There are moms who are doing this on their own. And we want you to know that we're your family. And we support you, and we love you, and we're with you. So there are, you know, there are moms uh, who are facing something different this year in that they're facing uh, even a Mother's Day uh, celebration alone because loved ones have gone to heaven. And this has happened for several of our ladies, and we want you to know that we have compassion with you, and we're praying for you as well. So... I may have left some out, and if I did, like there are those that didn't have a good relationship with their mom. Um, with, uh, with, I, with mine, she would just spank you and get you in order and, and uh, that type of thing. But there are those that, that perhaps didn't have um, a good relationship, and perhaps mom was difficult, uh, and vice versa. Perhaps the child was difficult. There are those that have not reached their goal of motherhood yet, and we wait expectantly with you, and we're excited for you. So if you were left out, it wasn't intentional, but wherever you are in life, as a woman, you have the capacity to affect lives around you, and that is exactly what we want to talk about today. As a woman, you have a purpose. Now... Mother is defined as a woman in relation to her child or her children, one who brings up a child with care and affection. And that could be biologically, it could be through uh, social work, it could be fostering and adoption, and uh, it could be just by being a spiritual mentor. Because another definition says someone who treats others with kindness and affection and tries to protect that person from danger or difficulty. Now that sounds like a mom, doesn't it? 
And that also sounds like a spiritual mother. And one thing we're passionate about here at the Gulf Coast Christian Center are spiritual mothers. Women who feed into and nurture other women and children and men when necessary. But we'll leave that to the men and the dads. So we believe that the name Mother incorporates all women. And we want you to know that we celebrate you today. This morning, I want you to leave this gathering celebrating who you are as a woman gifted by God. Now, there's a portion of scripture for those of you that have not had children yet, for, for people who have. Uh, this applies to all women, and it's a prophetic utterance from Isaiah 54. And man, you can grab hold of this as well. It says, Sing, barren woman who has never had a baby, fill the air with song, you who've never experienced childbirth. You're ending up with far more children than all those childbearing women. God says so. Clear lots of ground for your tents. Make your tents large. Spread out. Think big. Use plenty of rope. Drive the tent pegs deep. You're going to need lots more elbow room for your growing family. Now that's for each and every one of us. It's prophetic. It's a promise. And I want you to take hold of that. And I want you to see yourself as growing spiritual children as well. Men, you can take hold of this too. It's not just to the women because there are places in our lives where we need to grow. Ladies, there are places in our lives we need to grow. We haven't seen something happen. And he says, make your tips large, spread out, think big, drive those tip pegs deep. So I got very excited when uh, some lady shared that scripture with me. Now, men, I know this is geared toward women, but I'm asking that you lean in. Because as you lean in and hear, you're going to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And you're going to see how important, first of all, I believe you know how important women are in your life. But you're going to see God's plan for women and what he has for them. So lean in, lean in. And there's things here that you can take hold of. God wants us to expand our minds our thinking and our hearts to know that God has more for us. I'm going to read it again. He wants us to expand our minds, our thinking, and our hearts to know that God has more for us. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who by the action of his power that is at work within us is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly, Far over and above all that we dare ask or think. Infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. Now, this is God for us. This is his plan for us. Paul's telling us this is what God wants to do for us. Women, you dream. We're dreamers. And he wants to do super abundantly above far over what we already can dream. In other words, when he gives us a dream, then he adds to it, and he makes it larger, and he makes it bigger. And we're thankful for that, aren't we? Because we've seen him. It's like, it's like uh, we're excited, and then he adds more excitement on. So he wants us to expand our minds and our thinking. When he gives you a dream, expand it a bit more. God also wants us to believe that he really is upgrading, elevating, and advancing us. He's upgrading us. Already he gave us Jesus. Already he set us at the right hand of the Father. And we're looking down victoriously with him. He has upgraded us and he wants to continue elevating us in every status in our lives. He wants to elevate us in the area of our jobs in our families, in the area of our influence. He wants to elevate and he wants to advance. And I just speak that over each of you today. God is elevating you. God is advancing you. And God is upgrading you in your life. 
in the name of Jesus. Now I want you to understand, it's not just everybody else. It's you too. If you can dream it for somebody else, then you can dream it for yourself. Amen? God wants us to steward everything He gives us diligently, even if it seems small at first. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. And by the time you get to be my age, which 70 sounds really close, by the time you get there, you've had a lot of small beginnings in your life. And then you've had the opportunity to see God take those small beginnings and do something with it and bless you in your life. And He blesses us because we step out. He blesses us because we, we take what He gives us and we go forward. So God also wants us to go after everything He tells us to do with all our heart. Now that can be in the home and that can be in life. That can be what He speaks to you. That can be at your job. Go for it with all your heart. Take the next few days, weeks, and months. And I, I'm, I'm asking you with Isaiah 54 to take that chapter. And just take like a scripture a day. You may take a scripture a week and that's all right. And I ask that you will take that scripture. And it says, Sing, O barren woman who has never had a baby. Fill the air with song you've never experienced childbirth. And I want you to say, Father, what does this mean? Holy Spirit... What does this mean? And what are you saying to me in this scripture? And I guarantee you, he's going to begin to show you things. And he's going to begin to have you pray over certain things and certain people. And then he's going to give you a supernatural idea. You might say, well, I, I don't understand. I don't, I don't quite understand that. Well, that's okay. You take that scripture and you take all the different translations and you read it. You read it until you find one that you understand and makes sense. Like the Isaiah 54 we read was from the Message Bible. It's good in all of the translations, but this one really spoke to me. And so it just made it more plain for me. Now, if you still don't understand, it's okay. Ask one of us because that's what spiritual mothers are for. And we love to answer your questions. When I was asking the Lord, what am I going to uh, teach about? What would you like me to teach about? Uh, I heard him say in one area, he said, don't be afraid of the giants. And in fact, I was working out at Grit with Christian, and a song had come on, and I don't know their playing is, but a song had come on, and it said, the first one said, uh, don't try to keep me down. And so here we're doing these exercises. By the way, I was at Grit Fitness, which that's a plug for Roy and Rachel, uh, co-owners of Grit Fitness, and uh, they're helping keep me fit. And so what happened is, uh, the first one said, don't try to keep me down. And I thought, yeah, don't try to keep me down. And of course I'm talking to all the ideas in my mind that uh, when, when I'm saying you can't do that, you can't do that, or to the enemy when he comes and he lies to us. But the other one was, don't be afraid of the giants. A song came on, on and I don't know what that song was. I have no idea. And I did try to find it, but I couldn't find it. And so, uh, but it said, don't be afraid of the giants. And, when, and I was doing, um, I was doing burpees. But they were modified because I had done something to my shoulder. And I'm in the middle of burpees and I hear, don't be afraid of the giants. And my spirit leapt. Because as a woman, there are a lot of giants that come against you. There are a lot of things that try to stop you and hinder you. And so um, I got very excited and then the Lord began talking to me. Now, what I titled the sermon was... There is just something about a woman. Because you're relentless. Because you are brave. And because you love with all your heart. There's just something about a woman. And normally most women are going to believe that you could be president of the United States. Moms, you could be, you could be president of the United States. You, you, could, you, know, you could marry a king. 
Because they believe in you. You can do anything you want to do. Because moms believe in their children. Amen? And I'm, I want you to know, my spiritual children, I believe in you. I believe in everything God has spoken to you. And I'm excited for you. So, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, my first point. A woman with purpose stands strong in, in the face of giants. Now, there's a song by uh, Francesca Battistelli. And it talks about the giants. Don't let the giants go, get in the way. Because it says that when you speak, that the giants fall. And the song was actually written for a young girl who, age, at, at the age of 11, uh, heard the Uganda Children's Choir. They came to her church, and she was very moved by these children. And it was the Uganda Orphans Choir. Touched her heart. So uh, later on, she was at home one day, and her parents said, Mallory, what do you want for Christmas? And she said, I'll have to think about it. And she said, I was in my room, and I was thinking and looking around my room and thought, I have everything. I don't need anything. And so she asked her parents if it would be okay if she used the money they were going to spend on her for Christmas and send it to the children of Uganda. That's at the age of 11. At the age of 12, she made a visit to Uganda, and the Lord dropped in her heart to uh, start a foundation called Project Yesu. And so at that young age, she starts a project. And at the age of 13, she writes Francesca Battistelli. And this is, this is what she said. She wanted to invite her to come to a benefit concert. She said, people are telling me I'm crazy for writing you, that you'll never read this. Or if you do, you'll never write me back. But I've learned one thing in the last couple of years. Now remember, this was starting at age 11. She's 13 now. God is able to do so much more than I can. Just step out in faith and ask. So she said, I am asking if you will come to a benefit concert for Project Yesu to raise funds for Ugandan children. Miss Battistelli got the note, and she wrote back, yes, of course I'll come. And the next day, she was in a writing gathering with her team, and they said, what do you want to write about? And she said, I want to write a song for this young girl and for the benefit concert. And so she wrote the song, uh, Giants Fall, and it says in the chorus, don't you be afraid of giants in the way, with God, you know that anything is possible. So step into the fight. He's right there by your side. The stones inside your hand may be small, but watch the giants fall. Wow. And it's a really neat song, and maybe at the end we can play it. But uh, the, uh, it seemed like for this young girl, first of all, you get a celebrity musician to come to your, your benefit, concert, uh, benefit fundraiser, but also, this little girl didn't have a whole lot in her hand, but she had a dream, and she had a purpose, and it's amazing what purpose can do. And so she, what she had in her hand, she just used it to go after it. And there are many giants that will try and get in our way, but God says, fear not, for I am with you. I want to tell you one other. There's a, a woman, her, a young girl, actually, at the age of 19. Her name was Maggie Doyen. And Maggie uh, was a, a senior in high school, and she had worked really well, and she was going to go off to college. But in her mind, she got the idea of taking a gap year. Now, most parents will go, oh, no, we don't want you to take a gap year. But her parents said, you know, we trust you, we believe in you, so go. And this girl went around the world in many ways and ends up in Nepal. Now, I can't imagine going to Nepal by myself. But she was bold, and she was ready. And when she got to this town, what she saw was a lot of children. And they had just come out of a civil war of some kind um, not too long before. And she saw orphans, and they, they had no one. And so she spent a lot of time there, and what happened 
is she called her parents and said, I've saved uh, $5,000, it's in my savings account, and I would just like to know if it would be okay with you. I would like to take that money and I want to build a home for them. And I'm assuming in Nepal that, that it was probably quite profitable to, to be able to do something like that. And so she took her money, she built a home, and this girl at the age of 19 became the mother of orphans. And at one point she had like 40 orphans and got up to like 51 orphans. And that's what she has spent her life doing the last few years. I think she's around probably somewhere between 28, 30 years of age. And God has blessed her and opened doors for her, just like he did for the, the young girl, Mallory. Because she had nothing in her hands. Well, she did have $5,000, but she was willing to use it. And she just began to put it forward, and then God began to bless. You can't stop a woman with purpose, can you? Praise the Lord. So think about that with your purpose while we, while we go on. David had a sword, and he had his confession. So in 1 Samuel 17, it says, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Now this young man, that's the thing, he's young. So don't ever get too old to believe God. Now, I realize that young people can go and they can run, but come on, come on people, older than the teenagers and come on people my age and older we always need to have a purpose in the verse 46 he said this day this is he's talking to Goliath this day the Lord will hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and cut off your head today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beast of the earth and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Now, don't you want to say that today? Yes. Don't you? You come to me with accusation, Satan. You come to me, mind and memory about things, and you start shouting these accusations. But I come to you right now with the sword of the Spirit. I come to you with the Word of God. I come to you as a child of God with the confession that God is on my side. I will not fear what comes against me. And think about it. He didn't have Jesus. David, he had God. And he knew this because he had cultivated that relationship with him. And he was a kid. He was a teenager, basically. And so, uh, hey, God can do all things for us and through us. I just keep hearing my father is bigger than your father. Yeah. Say that to the enemy when he comes against you. Wouldn't you like to say that to some people that, that kind of yeah, yeah, at you? Yeah? You can't say I'm going to cut your head off with a... Uh, but uh, you, you might get a visit at your front door. But you can tell the devil that, can't you? And you can use words that the Lord gives you to come against your enemies. So uh, in verse 47, it said, All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Let's say that. The battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. We've all heard that we are a part of something bigger, and that is the truth. Say, I'm a part of something bigger. That gets us off of right now where it looks like what can we do and it causes us to go further. It expands our tent. It expands our borders. Don't talk about how big your giant is. Talk about how big your God is. Amen? Yeah. David said, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. And ladies and gentlemen, the, the Lord who rescued you from everything that you've gone through in your life, he'll rescue you again. He'll rescue you from the Philistine. He's already rescued you from the devil. Amen? Get a picture of that in your head. He's already rescued me through the blood of Jesus. Now, a woman with purpose 
chooses to stand in the face of the giants. But she also chooses to listen to the naysayers. Have you ever had any naysayers in your life? <laughs> okay, just a few of you. There are always naysayers. And about the time you think you got it and you got it right, there will be a naysayer that comes along. So uh, we have to, we do not listen to the naysayers. Somebody will say, you can't do that. You're not capable of doing that. Or, well, why would you even want to do that? So when the enemy wants to use naysayers, we need to remember that they may not think it is a good idea, but God has put a dream in someone's heart. And she may not know how to go about it, or even how to do it. She doesn't even know how to try to go ahead and do it. But she doesn't need naysayers in her way. And couldn't I just would like to say this, that with all the conquering that we need to do, how many of you really need to conquer something in your life? Yeah. I dare say each and every one of us, there's, there's challenges at every age, amen? But, with all the naysaying that goes on, we do not need to have naysaying from our own families and from other people. Uh, we should not be receiving naysaying from those closest to us. And you might have to, you might have to put a stop to that. And it's okay to say, uh, I'm not going to listen to this. It's okay for you to smile and just stop the conversation, change the conversation and go find somebody that's going to stand with you in faith. So instead of naysaying, if you're a naysayer, surely none of you are. But instead of naysaying, let's try this. That's an interesting idea. How would you go about that? Well, have you considered this possibility? So in other words, you're not saying, nah, you can't do that. Nah, that's a dumb idea. No, you're actually encouraging, you're asking some questions, and you are allowing the person to expand their mind and to think and to dream. Because see, naysaying, if someone doesn't know how to handle it and deal with it, it'll shut that dream down. And what if your naysaying stops the purpose of God in that person's life? What if there is somebody that's actually going to get saved by this idea? We don't want to be the naysayer, do we? Amen. So Mallory's parents could have said, Mallory, you're just a teenager. Uganda is so far away. Why, you, why, not, why, why not next door? Let's just go into our city. Well, God put Uganda in her heart. And had they been naysayers, they could have killed that dream. If you do not agree with something and it doesn't harm anything, then just say, honey, if you can believe God for it, then I can agree with you. Now, that's what a woman wants to hear. Honey, I can agree with you. And you may not have the faith for that, but that's okay. You can stand in agreement. And you can smile. And you can encourage her. Joshua and Caleb saw giants in their way. Ten men said it could not be done to go into the land of Canaan, the land of promise. Ten spies said it can't be done. It's too big. They'll kill us. They're too big. And uh, what did Joshua and Caleb say? They said, oh yeah. Oh yeah, we can do this. We are well able. We are well able. So scripture says that the Israelites, after this talk with Moses, the other Israelites went about the camp talking about stoning Joshua and Caleb. Can you believe that? Joshua and Caleb gave the report of the Lord they agreed with Moses, they agreed with God, and the people in the camp wanted to kill him for it. Numbers 13.30 says that Caleb said, let's go at once to take the land. He said, we can certainly conquer it. Oh, I love being around people like that. We can certainly conquer it. Numbers 14.8, Joshua said, do not rebel against the Lord. Now notice, when he said do not rebel against the Lord, he's saying don't rebel against the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord had already been given. So he's saying don't rebel against God and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection. 
But the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. Wow. What a word of uh, encouragement. And don't we want to hear words of encouragement in our life? All right. So don't be afraid. A woman of purpose does not listen to the naysayers. Now, a woman of purpose has wisdom and good judgment and discernment. And what happens is that is cultivated. If you don't have it right now, whenever you are cultivating it through reading Proverbs, the Word of God, and praying, you learn to have and develop an ear for discernment. So women do have great tuition. In intuition, great tuition, yeah. We've paid off some of those college bills. But women have great intuition and discernment. They sense things with their hearts, with their spirits, with their eyes. And as you all know, women have eyes in the back of their heads anyway. So many of us know the story of Deborah in Judges 4. She was a prophetess and a judge. She was given a word from God for Barak. He was a ruler of ancient Israel and he was a commander of the Israelite army. They had been under the rule of Canaan for around 20 years. And so, uh, you know, that would happen. They'd get right with God, they'd have a great judge or a great king, and then they would fall away from it. That king would die, they would fall away from God. And it would start all over again. But the enemy king at this time was Jabin. Now, Deborah, as a judge, first of all, she was a woman in those days. And you can imagine uh, what she may have come against. But they say that she was very respected, she was loved, and that she was honored. Kudos to the men that gave her honor. Judges 4 and 6, the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go, take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. God says, I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Now that sounds like a victory to me, doesn't it? Yeah, God spoke. And he spoke through a woman. And Barak, the commander, said, If you go with me, I'll go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Now, he could have been scared because there's been lots of talk about this. He could have been afraid. And if I was going up against thousands and thousands of men, I'd be afraid. If I was going up against thousands and thousands of women, I would be afraid. I would feel fear. Yeah. <laughs> I would just want... Uh, I'd want my grip people, and then I would, I, I would want Gabby and Christy by me, too, because they do jujitsu. So I'd want them in my camp. So perhaps he was afraid, but perhaps he also so respected Deborah and knew the gift of God on her that he wanted her with him. And so uh, the Bible says she gave him a scripture. Well, she gave him a prophecy, and here's what it said. Certainly, I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. Now, this was a prophecy. And so I don't believe she was saying, you little chicken, because you don't want to go without me, you're, uh, you're not going to get the glory. I don't, I don't believe it was that way at all. I believe that Deborah had seen something I believe that she saw something, the Lord spoke something into her spirit, because that's the only reason she would have said this anyway. And she said that the honor will go to a woman. And he probably said, that's okay with me as long as you're there. Now, Deborah does go with Barak and gives him instructions on when to fight, and they defeat the Canaanite army. But the commander escapes, and he runs away to hide. And this is Sisera. And he ran to a man's house named Heber. And uh, he had an alliance with him, so he ran there to be protected and like covenant. He had covenant with him. And so uh, Heber had a wife named Jael. 
And this is what the Word of God says. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, I can't you just envision this in your mind. He went out, she, she went out to Sisera and says, come Lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said, and I imagine he was thirsty after fighting battles. And so uh, he said, I'm thirsty. Please give me a drink of water. So she opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. And the word of God says, he said to, Sisera said to uh, Jael, stand in the doorway of the tent. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone, is anyone there? Say no. And I'm sure she said, gotcha. Because here's what happened. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tip peg and a hammer and went quietly to Sisera while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground and he died. A woman had the honor of killing the enemy. Now, I guarantee you, oh, oh, let me finish this first. This reminds me of that scripture when we read it, stretch out your tents, stretch out your pegs, be ready, expand, because uh, just then, Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went in there with her, and he, there lay Sisera with a tip peg through his temple, dead. Now, I'm sure Jael didn't wake up that morning thinking, I'm going to kill the commander of the Canaanite army today. She had no idea when she woke up what would come her way. But I tell you what, she had something in her hand, and she used it. It says that when the giant presented itself, she took him down. Here's another thing. That tent peg went deep down. It went down into the ground. That was one strong moment. I like that story because it's good for any child of God, but it is fun for a woman. It's fun to know a woman did. Now, in 1 Samuel 25, we read about a woman named Abigail who was married to a man named Nabal. And during this time, David was still living in exile because King Saul was trying to kill him. And David, in the previous chapter, had had a chance to kill Saul, but he honored him, and he chose not to. So David and his men had been in Nabal's territory and in exile, and they had caused no problems for Nabal or his shepherds. They hadn't stolen anything. And I want to read this because I think it'll be better if I read it. So the man's name was Nabal and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. He was a Calebite. Now a Calebite descended from the family of the lineage of Caleb. And let's talk about this. Caleb is the one back that we read about in 1 Samuel, he's the one that said, we can take the land. We can do what God has told us to do. And you know what? I don't think he would be very happy with Nabal because he did not carry on the tradition, did he, of uh, Caleb. So uh, while David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So he sent young men to them saying, go up to Nabal and greet him in my name. Say, long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. They just needed some supplies. David was going to be the future king anyway. Well, the servants went, and they met Nabal. And you know, when you have sheer sheep, sheer sheep shearing going on, there's always a festival at the end. And so he knew that there would be uh, plenty of supplies. Well, here's what Nabal said. Have you noticed all these names? I mean, uh, Abigail, Nabal, J.L. I'm glad my name's Candy. 
Just simple candy. So what happened is Nabal said, who is this David? Who is the son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men coming from who knows where? And so uh, he, sent, uh, he sent them on and said, uh, go away. And so Nabal, it said, really insulted them. They turned around. They turned around and they went back to their hideout. And just so you know, I'm almost through. So hang tight. So everyone had heard of David, including Nabal. So this would have been a big deal to hear their master refuse to help David and his army. Now, one of the servants heard this and went to Abigail, his wife, and said, Listen, David's men were just here and your husband insulted them. And I'm very concerned about what could happen because the truth is, while David and his men, and there were 600 of them, but while they were in our territory, they watched over us, they protected us. As a matter of fact, they had a, a circle of men around the shepherds to make sure that they were safe. They didn't steal anything from them. They didn't ask anything of them. They didn't take anything from them. And the servant said, he was kind to us. And your husband was very insulting, and I'm concerned. So Abigail, who had a spirit of discernment and purpose, she acted quickly. It says in verse 18, she took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five sayas, if I am pronouncing that correctly, of roasted grain, a hundred cakes of raisins, and 200 cakes of pressed figs. Wouldn't you like to have one of those pressed fig cakes? It just sounds so good to me, and uh, it would be on the wild diet, so I would be happy about that. She loaded them on donkeys, and she told her servants, go on ahead, I'll follow you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. You see, he was in there partying, partying and he was already drunk. And he was just having a field day with his life. He was happy. So, she, so she's on her donkey, and as, as she comes, she meets David. And it said that when she met him, she fell down, and she bowed before him. And she said this, pardon, in verse uh, around 20, 24, pardon your servant, my Lord, and let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. I love this. Please pay no attention, my Lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool. And folly goes with him. And as for me, your servant, I did not see the men my Lord sent. And now my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal. Because let me tell you what happened. When, when David's men came back and said he wouldn't give us anything, David said, slap on your swords, I'm going to kill him. And he took 400 men with him to go and destroy the entire household of Nabal. And really it was, uh, as you read later it says, he was going to kill every single man in the household, the servants of Nabal. So uh, David, David said this. He said uh, in verse 32, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you to you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal, would have been left alive by daybreak. That's, that's one tough future key, isn't it? He told her, go home in peace. I have heard your words and granted your request. Now what happened is, Abigail goes home and Nabal's too drunk to talk to, so she waits. And on the next morning, she tells him what happened and she tells him what she did. 
And uh, the Bible says that he fell down like stone. So what happened, he either had a heart attack or he had a stroke. And within 10 days, he was dead. Okay, sounds good. And so what happened is he was either so afraid of what he had done and of what could have happened, or he was mad as a hornet that she'd given away all this stuff. Who knows? I don't know, but yeah. It, when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Praise to the Lord who has upheld my cause against Nabal for treating me with contempt. He has kept his servant from doing wrong and has brought Nabal's wrongdoing down on his own head. So then David sent word to Abigail asking her to become his wife. His servants went to Carmel and he said to Abigail, David has sent us to you to take you to become his wife. Honor the things that God will do for people who show honor. And it lets me know, I want each of you to know you're anointed by God. You have Jesus inside of you. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. You're anointed by God. And the Word of God says, touch not my anointed. So uh, he cares about you. Abigail actually cared enough about her husband and her household to stand humbly before the future king. And God honored her for it. Man, there's just something about a woman. The last one is a woman of purpose is a praying woman. To accomplish our assignment in life, women need to have discernment and they need to know how to pray. Second, oh no, it's 1 Thessalonians 5.17 tells us to pray without ceasing. And one thing we're committed to at the Gulf Coast Christian Center is teaching people to pray. Prayer is not dull. It is powerful and it changes lives, generations, nations, and most of all, families. I want you to write down something that you're believing God for. I have a lot of them. But I want you to write something down that, that is first and foremost in your heart. Keep that before you and find you a scripture that supports that desire. Thank Him for it. Pray that scripture over it. See it happening in your mind and in your heart. Now how do we pray without ceasing? Because that sounds hard, doesn't it? Pray without ceasing. Well, we. We do it by practicing His presence. Acts 2.42 says, They devoted themselves to the Word, broke bread, and prayed. Ephesians 6.18 says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So there's too much at stake not to pray. There's a, a documented story that I want to tell you about. And it's almost unbelievable, but it's documented. And so it's a true story. And it's an amazing answer to a mother's prayer. In 1829, there was a schooner called the Mermaid that set sail from Sydney, Australia for Collier Bay. Now, Captain Samuel Nolbrow was the skipper and the ship carried a crew of 18 and three passengers. On the fourth day, the wind died down. And something happened, a storm came up, and the, the mermaid was in the treacherous Torres Strait separating Australia and New Zealand, and those waters are rough. It's rough just on the beach. It's cold, and it's rough. Now, the storm struck shortly before midnight, and what happened is the captain and crew fought to swing the schooner from her course and keep it from disaster. Despite that, the mermaid ran into a coral reef and the bottom was ripped open and uh, everyone had to abandon ship. So here you are, said they started swimming to a large rock about 200 feet away. And what happened is for three miserable days these survivors huddled on that rock. Then the ship, the swift shore, came and rescued them. Now, later that same day, the Swiftsher broke up and they had to abandon ship. So the first ship sunk, the second ship sunk. It, it went against rocks and broke up. Later that same day, the schooner, Governor Reddy, 
when a crew of 32 appeared after taking on the marooned crews of the other two vessels. The schooner was somewhat crowded as she sailed away to the west. About three hours later, that schooner caught fire and everybody had to abandon ship. Now they were many miles from shipping lanes, but the Australian govern government cutter called the Comet came along. It had been blown off course by the storm. So there was a, uh, they brought them on and it was a lot of elbow room. And so what happened is they became suspicious because this, these people had had so many shipwrecks. So the crew of a comet expected trouble and five days later, they got what they asked for. A violent storm snapped off the comet's mast and ripped away her sails and carried off her rudder. She began to sink. They launched the only longboat and the rest kept floating in the wreckage. For 18 hours, they drifted in the cold sea fighting sharks. Then along came, they called it a packet. Along came another boat called the Jupiter. And again, they were rescued. For a fourth time, not a single life had lost. But two days later, the Jupiter hit a reef and sank. Yeah. But the passenger vessel, the city of Leeds, was close at hand to take them all on board and transfer them safely to Sydney. Five ships had been lost. And I, I'm going to tell you that if that had happened, I would be feeling sorry for myself. Yeah. But it says this man, Peter Ritchie, Richley, who had been on all of these boats, it said that he actually relaxed because he realized if God had saved him this many times, then he had a plan for him. Amen? So here's the most amazing part. As he was on the, uh, the city of Leeds ship, the captain came to him and said, we have an elderly English woman and she is critically ill. She had earlier told passengers that she was going to Australia in hopes of finding her son who had run away 15 years ago and joined the Navy. She had never heard from him, and Navy officials said he had served his term and left. Delirious, she called constantly. She had fever, she was sick, she was dying. She called constantly for her son, and the doctor decided to ease her dying moments by getting a sailor to pretend he was her son. He looked around for a young man the approximate age and description of Peter Richley and chose one of the few of the mermaid. This story is about Peter Richley. The seamen agreed to help the doctor, and as they walked to her cabin, the doctor said, Now listen, this is how we'll do it. This woman's name is Sarah, and she's from Yorkshire. And here's what I need you to do. But as they got to the room, it said that he stopped. And he realized that the woman that was dying was his mother, Sarah Richley. And he realized that her prayers to see him again had kept him alive. God honors prayers. Amen? It said that he prayed for her. And you know what? It said in, in one account, it said that she lived and had time to spend with him a number of years. This is true. It's crazy. But it's true. It's documented. And besides that, I heard Jensen Franklin telling the story. And if Jensen Franklin says it on national TV, it must be true. Amen? So to pray without ceasing means nonstop or frequently reoccurring. Just be sensitive to the Holy Spirit in our lives. And when He comes to our mind or when He speaks to us, listen and pray. Ralph Waldo Emerson in one of his sermons said, It is not only when we audibly and in form address our petitions to the deity that we pray. We pray without ceasing. Every secret wish is a prayer. Every house is a church. The corner of every street is a closet of devotion. So women of purpose, pray. We talked today that women of purpose stand strong in the face of giants. They do not listen to the naysayers. They are women of purpose with wisdom and discernment. And women of purpose also pray. And I want to bless you women today. You're so important. Thank you men for being patient. 
Thank you for letting us have some fun talking about women in the Bible. But I want to bless you. And let's just bow our heads. Father, I thank you for all the women in this church. And I thank you that we are called by God. And you have placed a purpose inside each one of us. And I thank you that purpose is greater than any of us could ever expect or imagine. But I bless the ladies today, Father. Those who have jobs those who uh, stay at home, those who have unsaved husbands, and those who are looking for husbands, those who desire God to work in their lives, those that are, are seeking to have children or adopt or foster. Now I cover you women in the blood of Jesus, and I speak a blessing upon you that you will be strong in the Lord and in the power of His mind. I prophesy that God is opening up doors for you. God is making ways for you that you had no idea could even happen for you. God is causing dreams to come true that you've been praying for for a long time. God is restoring relationships. God is strengthening you. And God is blessing you. And I, I prophesy that God is financially taking care of you and blessing you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for the women of our church. Amen. Amen. Thank y'all for staying. Thank you. Thank you. That's why we give you a gift in case church goes longer that way. You're happy.